When we read the Bible through the lens of historical context, for instance, we understand about this passage that some scholars think it happened like this that when the new church was forming, this was the first time that women were really part of worship and part of formal teaching about Scripture. So some scholars suggest this, that uh, in a particular church in Corinth, uh, someone would get up to read the Scripture. They would unroll the scroll and begin to read. And at that point, Mrs. Smith, sitting back there in the sixth row, said, what do you think that means? I don't understand that. Do you think they're really talking? And she would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk through the entire reading of the Word. And so some scholars think that that's what this is really referring to that nobody wanted to sit around Mrs. Smith because she talked during worship. Women, please be silent in church. If you have a question, wait until you're home and ask your husband about it instead of interrupting everybody else's worship experience. You see, when I read that text through the lens of historical context, that takes on a whole new meaning for me. When I understand that Paul, in his historical context, was actually quite the feminist, it takes on a whole new meaning for me. So the lens of historical context is one of those lenses we can use. Um, there's also the lens of, of science. We know that the world was not created in seven days. We can also apply that lens of science to the Levitican Code. It helps us to understand why these things are there in the Bible, that in a pre-scientific world, the people understood that anything that could potentially kill them, they understood that as being the wrath of God. And so, if somebody goes um, fishing, they catch some shrimp, they don't cook it all the way, and they get food poisoning, then suddenly that ends up as one of the purity codes. Don't eat shrimp. It's an abomination. The same thing, um, the same thing with sexual intimacy. Diseases get passed through bodily fluids. People have sex, they get sick, they die. Must be the wrath of God. When we use the lens of science, we understand Scripture in a completely different way. There's also the lens of, of our contemporary experience. I was reading this week in the news about the the Malawi couple who was released from prison, um, two men who had thrown this lavish, uh, lavish engagement party, and they were imprisoned. When I read this scripture, 1 John 4, 7, and 8, through the lens of modern-day contemporary experience, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I see this passage in a whole other way. I think, I think of those men who love each other, who suffered imprisonment in Malawi, and the ways in which they saw the face of God by looking at each other the ways in which they recognize the face of God in the face of the one that they love. And I see this passage in a whole new way. There's also the lens of personal experience. This passage, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm one of those people for whom if we're always using masculine language about God, it pinches just a little bit. For some people, 
father language about God is very comforting, and for other people, it's very disturbing because of our personal experience. But I got a new lens added to this, um, to this passage yesterday. We were in the park talking to a man and his son who had recently moved here from Israel. And I heard the little boy say, Abba, Abba, come over here and play with me in the sandbox. Abba, come, I want to show you something. And remembering that any time father is translated in the Bible, it was translated from the word Abba. It doesn't mean stern father. It means the daddy that's going to play in the sandbox with you. That's the kind of God that we have. All of these lenses matter. So I want to do something this morning with this passage that we started with, understanding that we are not really sheep and God is not really a shepherd, but knowing that God loves us and cares for us like a shepherd to his flock. I want to do this morning to use the lens of personal experience to call to mind a time in your life when you were afraid or a time in your life when you were parched. A time in your life when you were in need of protection. A time in your life when you just needed to rest. Bring to mind that moment. And I invite you to close your eyes and to see the 23rd Psalm through that lens of your own experience. God, you are my shepherd, and I'll never be in want. You make me lie down in green, lush pastures, and you lead me beside still waters. God, you restore my soul. You lead me in paths of righteousness, in straight paths for your name's sake. And even though, even though, God, it feels like I am walking in the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to be afraid because you are with me. Your rod that you use to beat back people who would do me harm, and your staff that you use to pull me in whenever I stray too far, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Even though I want to hang my head low, you lift it up and you anoint my head with oil so it shines and my cup overflows. Surely, surely, God, your goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in your house forever. Amen.